Good evening. We're on the air again with another edition of Patients on the News, and I think this one is a particularly interesting one. Our guest is Sean Moody. Many of you know Sean uh, because he was the uh, Republican nominee for governor uh, uh, not long ago, and so and many of you probably supported Sean. You've known about him a long time. You know about Moody's Collision Centers. Uh, He's a guy who built a business, a big business, and then essentially has turned it over over time to his employees. Their empl it's an employee's own business. So you know all of this about uh, Sean, but he's on to other things uh, now. He's still r r running his business, but he's a citizen. And he uh, knows about some of our problems in our state, and he has some ideas of how to, how to fix them the difference between Sean and many other people is he's actually trying to do something to fix the problems, not just talk about it. He's going to talk about it here. He's going to talk about what he's trying to do to solve these problems. And it's, you know, we have a huge number of immigrants in Maine now, and we have a huge shortage of people in trades and in other jobs. You see a lot of help wanted, and you see a lot of immigrants that aren't working in these places where they need help. So he's going to talk about that. I'm going to preface it with a very short story about why I'm in America. I had two grandfathers, all four of my grandparents and my, and my father emigrated to this country. But my two grandfathers first came in the late 1890s. And they were rec from small Greek villages, different villages, in southern Greece, poor, very poor. And at that time, there was a great labor shortage in the United States because the Industrial Revolution was reaching its peak. And so agents, employment agents, fanned out in, southern in, in the Mediterranean countries, in southern Europe, particularly e uh, Italy and Greece. And they went to these villages where the, all these teenage kids were looking for something to do. And they recruited them for the textile mills in Haverhill and Lawrence and Lowell, for the railroads, the transcontinental railroads were being built uh, between the Midwest and California. And in the Rocky Mountains, mines, metal mines. And in Pennsylvania and West Virginia, coal mines, and in the Midwest, stockyards. Hard work, tough work, and they recruited these kids to work at very low wages to fill these labor gaps in these burgeoning industries. And so the kids came. No English. They looked different, shorter, swarthy, spoke a different language, and they stuck together. They only had each they other. Had to. They had to. They only had each other. And they worked in these places. They worked very hard, and they stayed. And they continued to work hard. And they helped make America what it is today. They were not welcome, and they were feared. And in 1924, the Congress passed a law to keep out these undesirables mostly Southern Europeans, Italians, Greeks, and Eastern Europeans, Jews. And they created a quota system because they said, we got too many of them and we don't want any more. And that was the story of immigration. My people came, thankfully, before 1924, and that's how they got in. Now we have something similar. We're being overwhelmed by immigrants now, and it's a problem, and we need to have legislation in the Congress to fix and order the immigration problem. But we can't get it. We can't get it. Look into the reasons yourselves. I urge each of you to go online, to do a little research, and to find out why the Congress can't enact a immigration law that brings order out of chaos. So that's a little bit of background here, important background, I think. And now we have all of these people coming. I would add one other thing. When my people came from these small villages in Greece, 
The immigration laws were simple. You had to have a doctor's certificate that you were physically sound. You weren't having, you didn't come here with tuberculosis, right. something like that, and mentally sound. They didn't want people who weren't mentally sound. So those were the two things. The doctor's certificate was what you needed. You didn't have to have a visa. You didn't no have, age requirement. They're bringing them people over at 16 like you're doing. No dead. age requirements, nothing. They came. To work. As long as they had a doctor's certificate, they got off the boat and were admitted into the country. Uh, but they changed America, and they did the dirty jobs and the tough jobs mm. that no one else wanted to do. And they stayed, and the kids got educated, and they became senators and governors and CEOs Attorneys. and college presidents and lawyers. So we begin with that. Sean, welcome. Thank you, Harold. That's quite a story. I appreciate that story. Well, it's an important story I didn't for know people. That. That, this is not the first time we've been overwhelmed with immigrants. Immigrants. Right. This is a country of immigrants. That's and right. And they come because life is tough where they live, and they want to better their lives. And the ones who don't want to better their lives don't come. Well, I think what's happened, Harold, is because of our system and because of the the dysfunction of our system, not allowing them to work, it's word of mouth, right? So maybe some people are coming because they, they are being taken care of without working. Well, so, right. so you told me a good <laughs> Word time. of mouth is, is, is going to work both ways. We're not connecting people who are desperately looking for work, mostly a lot of them immigrants, right. with employers who are desperately, you told me, yeah. desperately looking for employees. Yeah, and it's across the spectrum. It's not just trades jobs. It's our hospitals, our nursing homes, you know, across white collar, blue collar, everybody's looking for. So how did you get in this? Okay, I said you're a good citizen, you look at a problem, and you try to find a way to, to, to solve it. So tell us a little bit about how you got interested in this. Well, I think it's, you know, we've, we've invested a lot of money, uh, the Alphon, right, the foundation, a lot of money nationally, federally is going into workforce development, which is a key component. Okay, whenever you, whenever you improve someone's skills through training, their productivity goes up incrementally, right? So if someone's, you know, used to doing a certain amount of work and then through training and through experience uh, and those grants, that, that funding, that is going to increase productivity and, and increase our GDP incrementally. But there's no substitute for having an individual, an additional person into the labor market. So, okay, this individual, it wasn't contributing at all so it's not an incremental increase, it's a, a full increase. So we need more individuals in the labor participation. So the way I looked at Harold is really simple. It's like these individuals came here, as you described, to try to better themselves, their families, and to seek that American dream or that opportunity. And our bureaucracy basically shut that down on them, unbeknownst to them. So many of them are here 6, 12, 18 months without being able to get a work permit. Now, think about that. Um, I was with Michael Bork. Actually, Mehmet gave, gave us a, a Workforce Development Award just recently. Michael and Bork is the CEO of, of, uh, Mer uh, of uh, Mehmet. Mehmet. Yes. Yeah. And he and Tony Payne, wonderful people. Yeah. And, and like Michael described, he said, if you take somebody that's in a lost time injury. Take the most productive person and say, okay, now all of a sudden they, they can't work for an extended period. These are American workers, okay, pro productive people with pride. If they're out of work for more than, you know, five, six, seven months, now they begin to, like, psychologically, it changes them. It's like, geez, I don't know if my knee's gonna be all right on that concrete floor, you know, my back, I don't know if I can get back to work. So there's a process to get them reacclimated, light duty, and so on. So if you take an immigrant that comes to this country and sits on the sideline for six months to a year, imagine what that does to their psyche. So that was, that's my point, Harold, is, is like, when you ride by, say you go down Congress Street, and you get three or four, you know, asylum seekers or, or whatever, hanging on the corner, and you get some guy has been hanging drywall all day, right, 5-H fire code, his help didn't show up, and he's looking over, look at the societal stigma that that puts, look at these guys don't want to work. So, so, you know, the, the societal impacts in our communities say, oh, they're lazy, they don't want to know, they can't yeah. work, they won't let them work. The federal law prohibits exactly. them from That's right. And they can't speak up for themselves. Right. So SOAR is, the acronym for SOAR is 
uh, skills and occupational assessment rating. And it's interesting, my wife Chrissy kind of came up, we were trying to think of a, a name or something that would catch, and she said, how about sore? <laughs> it's, it's unfortunate when I was thinking about a sore, you know, and I didn't catch sore, like sore. So I'll give Chrissy That's the credit a good one. I like for the that. name, yeah. sore. And the, the, the genesis behind it, Harold, is very simple. These individuals were working in their home country. They're doing something productive. They just didn't just, you know, wake up at 35 and decide to come to America. So they have skills. They have an occupation. And this program will basically assess their skill through interpreters, you know, the, so we have that language. In, in participation of our CTE schools and our community college system, very supportive of this program. What CTE schools? Uh, career Tech Ed. Okay. So vocational schools. These are the high schools? Uh, high school level, yes. As well as the community college system. Dan Bellier, David Daigle are very supportive. They've come up with funding for a position. So think about it, Harold. We bring that individual in, we interview them, create a resume for them, build their resume, and then we go over and do a hands-on skills assessment, hands-on, with an instructor. So in a few hours, they can pretty well know, say if this person was a carpenter, run a skill saw, you know, do, do some exercises to, to determine. To show us what this you can do. experienced. Yeah. Yeah. So now we populate the website with participating employers. That person's gonna be hired immediately. And so at you a fair wage. you certify them as, as we're going to rate them. It's a little You're difference rating. because yeah. a certification would have some sort of liability probably with it. Okay. We're rating these individuals yeah. to give the employer a general idea of their skill level. So when they come on the job site, um, they're going to be commanding a fair wage. The, the government, again, and the, <laughs> their dysfunctionality is, is now, I will say, I give Senator Collins credit and also our congressional delegation, okay, um, Representative Pingree and Golden, Senator King, they're all on board with us. We, we got them moving. So they're introduced legislation to shorten that work permit requirement down to 30 days. Well, what is, it, what is, what is the work permit requirement now? It's six months, but I think you talked, and I've talked to that uh, asylum seeker population at length. It's, it's not six months, it's, it's 12, 18 it, months. Almost indefinite in some cases. So it, this is a real, real problem. And when you think about we're spending 20 or 30 million dollars a year, Harold, okay, state, money to support these individuals because we won't allow them to go to work. It, it's, this, I'm so glad that you're broadcasting this message to our folks. They need to know. Well, it's, tr it's true. They won't let them go to work. And right. so uh, in, uh, in the effort by the Trump administration, I'm not getting political here, just t yeah. saying facts, to show that they're tough on immigration, in 2019, uh, they proposed rules that said, uh, one, the uh, 365 day waiting period before you could apply for a work permit. So you had to be here for a year yep. with, on general assistance, I makes, guess. Makes it no makes sense. No sense, but yeah. they, they proposed going from six months to 365 days. They bought, uh, uh, if you w went through a particular border station to get here, like El Paso or Laredo, uh, then you couldn't ever get asylum status uh, and a work permit. And new provisions that permitted automatic terminations of asylum seekers' employment so that if they had, and they had one year, so if they were employed for a year, they had to reapply. Mm. And if, and then they would get terminated uh, under certain circumstances, right. so you'd lose your job. You'd have to go, if you were yeah. one of these uh, immigrants, you'd have to go to your employer and say, I gotta leave this job. Well, I think, Harold, what you've touched on is, I, I'm not gonna say I could understand how we got where we are, because this was really way before Trump. But I think what happened was when we had such a high unemployment rate, which seemingly wasn't that long ago, really, right. I mean, it seems like it, right. but then I think the argument was, yeah. well, we don't want these individuals coming and taking American jobs. Right. So I, I do understand that, but yeah. it demonstrates 
government's inability to meet the times that we're in now, you know, and not live in, live in the old yeah. days. And like you said, Harold, you know, your grandfather came here. Uh, we have probably Both a mutual friend, Dominic Reale, right? Dominic yeah. is a great friend, and he tells the story, probably similar to your grandfather. He came uh, here to Munjoy Hill, started laying brick within a few days after he landed. That's a tough job. Worked his way up. The models, you know, get the first sandwich shop, and that's the rest is history. So immigration, legal immigration, we'll be clear on that, right? We're talking about legal. People are here legally. They've been, there's been screened, health screened, as you described, and security screened, and they're good to go. And, and to not allow them to participate, to feed the family, or to me, that's almost like a human rights violation. Sean, I understand what you say. It's, all, it's been said for generations, you know, they're taking our jobs. And these are jobs that Americans would like to have. Well, in most cases, in many cases, they're not jobs Americans would like You're to right, have. Harold. They don't You're want right. them. You can't get somebody who's been in family's been here for five generations to do the job. And you think of this. We have, uh, s we have seasonal businesses in this state. Right. Some are, some are restaurants and tourist places. Can't get Americans to do most of that work. We have, but we have a program for that, H-1 right. visas, so that people, young people can come from Eastern Europe to Bar Harbor, work for the season, and then go home. But yeah. they are foreigners, and they are here temporary, but right. we need them because Americans won't do that job. Go up to the blueberry fields right. in, uh, in Washington Wyman's. County, yep. okay? They come from South America, they come from other places, to Maine farms, to Break, harvest break blueberries. <laughs> blueberries, and that's because if they could get them to, 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 to from Washington County, who have been there generations, they would. But they have to bring them from somewhere else. If you go, go down to Florida, uh, in the in the rural areas and agricultural areas, you will find that there are these places where people from South America, many of them illegal immigrants, mm. many of them. They gather on a street corner, a particular street corner, in the morning. This is in many towns. And um, the agents come from the farmers, ah, they get picked and up they and say, we'll take 10 of you. They get in a minibus, and off they go to work for the day. Those are not Americans who want to do that. Right. These are, these are mostly people from Latin America, poor, wanting to do anything to make a living. So they're Mexicans, most of them. Yep. So we'll go beyond this, but. Harold, look, look at your yeah. profession. You know, take uh, lawyers and accountants and, and a, lot of, a lot of the white collar professional doctors, same thing. You know, we have a million students, okay, in our university mm -hmm. systems across this country right now, a million students that are here internationally. And they'll only keep a small amount of those. Two. So why does that make sense? To spend, right, give them the opportunity to come over here. They invest all that money in a public education and private college. They get educated and we send them home. And meanwhile, we don't have enough. Maybe we don't have enough lawyers. I don't know. But we certainly don't have enough psychiatrists, psychologists, doctors. You know, a, why does that happen, you know? We, there's a crisis in China, a looming economic crisis, because they don't have enough young people because the birth rate was so low. Right. So they're really worried about what will happen to the Chinese economy because right. of this crisis shortage of workers. Here in this state, no, uh, we, don't, we, we had, a de until very recently, a declining population. Right. And what was going to happen to the main economy? It yeah. was a, it, it's, it's a pretty tough situation. Suddenly, we have an influx of people from Africa, from Latin America, who want to work, who can't work, but they will, they solve the problem yeah. of, a lo of, of low population growth in Maine. That's right. And you know, and the other thing, as I said earlier, Harold, it, it's the social aspect. If, if, you, if you hired, okay, an, an asylum seeker or whomever, an immigrant, to come work in your place of business, and they prove themselves, right, like any yeah. new coworker would, three to six months, you're going to become their biggest advocate. So with the advocacy is out there, but they have to earn it like anybody has to earn it, and they can't earn it on the sideline. So it's another reason why, I don't know where the ACLU is on this. I mean, where are these folks 
Why aren't they up at City Hall right now? Well, hey, you legalize marijuana. Yeah. That's federally illegal. You know, <laughs> but you don't let these people work. You ask the question, where are these people? <laughs> well, we have a lot of organizations that only want to tell you about victims. These people are victims, and that's all they want to talk about. Well, how about getting them a job? You know, that's right. Joe Brennan, who I thought was just a great governor, I really did, and I've been around politicians a long time. Joe, governor, Joe Brennan used to go around this state when he was governor saying, the best social program is a job. Right. The best social program. He was from Portland, right? He's from so Portland. he knew full well yeah. immigration, so, what it did for this city. Yeah, because his, his father Mon was Joe an immigrant. Hill. Right here, Mon Joe Hill. His father was a longshoreman, from, he came from Ireland. So, Tough. Uh, you're on to something really important, but I want you to tell us how you're going to succeed. Well, your first step is you've got to change these rules. Now, I will tell you yeah, one well, thing. Yeah, well, it's in process. Now, again, now, raising public opinion. Well, you, you, it's in process Senator Collins, because there's a bill. That's right. Okay. That's correct. And the bill is sponsored by the senator from Arizona, Senator Collins, senator from Sintama, or whatever her name is, from Arizona. And it's a nonpartisan. And right? Angus you King. You've got Democrats, you've got Republicans. Yeah. It's so, universal. That bill has to pass. That's the biggest problem. Well, I think the economy, I, I was quoted in a little claim to economic fame. Uh, the Wall Street Journal called in 2017. This is pre-pandemic and low unemployment back then. And they're saying, you know, what are businesses doing about the, the low unemployment? How is that impacting you? And, and in the discussion, because I'm looking ahead 10 years, whatever it is, thinking that all the things you described, Maine's an aging state, people getting out of the trades, everyone's getting told they got to go to college. I see all these dynamics at work. So I made this statement, and they quoted me in the Wall Street Journal, and I said that the next recession could be generated by the lack of people to do the work. Look at where we are six years later, and it was exacerbated by the pandemic. Right. A lot of individuals our age, Harold, um, said, I'm not going to end up on a ventilator, yeah. right? I'm, I'm going to retire and right. be healthy, and, and I understand that. But they, they kind of exited. We won't let the immigrants work. Then you've got another population, our teenagers, Right? You can't, they can't be in a kitchen if they got a knife. They can't be in the shop if you've got a tool. It's ridiculous. I mean, these teenagers want it. They want to work, and they block them out. So the other thing that you're well aware of is Social Security um, punishing right, seniors at yeah. certain ages that can only earn up to $20,000 or whatever right. it is. Again, if people want to work, this is America. So why, so here, why would you restrict that? You or know why what? would you prevent Politics. That? Just all politics. Says me, the former politician, it's all politics. You're right. These things, there are things to do. There's legislation that can be enacted that will help alleviate these problems. Oh, it's and huge. it won't be enacted. And, and the individuals, uh, I'm, I'm not a, a CPA, but think about it. That, that's a liability, providing transportation, providing food, shelter, and everything for these individuals, right, to support them. Now all of a sudden, they're going to work. Now they're paying taxes, supporting themselves. It's like, you know, it's, it's an economic uh, reality. And you know, Harold, we, we had the discussion before we get on here here, but one thing that you really impressed, and you were really passionate when you said, my grandfather was a worker, and he came here, and he worked his way to prosperity because no one was telling him when, you know, how many hours he could put in, and he was working for low wages. He, he worked himself into prosperity. And, and that, I would like to think, that work ethic continued through that patience. You admire your grandfather. You're not going to slack, thinking about what he went through. True. There, there's a lot so, to that. So, so, so uh, we get it. You, you, the legislation has to pass. And I, uh, I, I think it's terrific that the three lead senators, two of them are from Maine, and Susan Collins That's right. is the primary sponsor. So. I wish them well. Uh, I'm not bullish on that because I see what happens. There is, there are many people in this Congress who think that if they vote for anything that is good for immigrants, yeah, that they'll that lose is, votes. In the southern, southwestern part of the country yeah. is obviously in a whole different situation. Yeah, you know, we've got hundreds of 
of immigrants coming to, to Maine, they've got hundreds of thousands coming over the border. So I, I can't even. But it's, poli you know. it's, it's politics, you know. It's if people, po politicians are afraid of getting hurt by a yeah. position that favors uh, uh, does anything for immigrants. So we'll see. Yeah. If, so. But a lot depends on it for your program, doesn't well, it? Well, I, I think, Harold, it's like, you know, a politician's, the old saying, they're thinking about the next election, not yeah. the next 10 years or whatever. So I'm just thinking about, we've got this legislation pending here now, that's a big deal. But I, I come back to the fact, okay, if we don't get our program in place, when they do finally issue these work permits, what are these individuals going to do? Like I said, they're going to be trying to find jobs at you know, minimum wage or, or whatever, they, they don't really have an opportunity. So what better way, it's just not to oversimplify it, they were doing something in their home country. We interviewed 30 of these individuals just recently over at the Southern Maine Community College campus, and it was fascinating. We had two project engineers, we had a doctor, we had a marketing person. You mean immigrants yes. who were doctors and engineers? Customer service representatives, yeah. they covered the gambit. And I, and I likened it to like, if you just took a population of people from, you know, from, from Africa in a town there and, and just transported them here, they'd be doing the same thing. They're living over there. They have to have cars. They, they have, you know, they, they do the same things that we do. So, uh, so th these people that you interviewed and that you had over at uh, SMTC, that, uh, they obviously already got St asylum status because they can get a work permit? Some of them had yeah. and some of them didn't. And I'll be honest with you, Harold, it was, it was kind of a testy, it turned into kind of a testy, um, and, and luckily we had some really good advocates there, Bruce Benner and uh, um, Amboli. He, there was another immigrant there that, did, that had the language, so they kind of diffused it. But what, what they were really upset about is they've been sold this bag of goods here several times and nobody's helping them. So they're really frustrated. It's like, well, it's, what's this, where are we going with this? You know, it's just another yeah. pitch, you know? And so once we got through that and opened them up and, and built a little trust. Okay, so what you, so your interview, let's say that, uh, that uh, I, I, I have a work permit, that I, that I qualify, I have asylum status, and I need a job, and I got three kids and I'm in a rental apartment in Portland, and I went to your thing, and, right. and uh, let's say we did that assessment. Well, let's say I'm an engineer, yep. and uh, I don't need. To, I know it's hard for me to get a job as an engineer, but I'll do anything. I'll I can be trained to be. I'm an electrical engineer. How about can I be trained to be an electrician? Well, that's that's the thing because their certifications again in their home country, if they were a doctor or an engineer, are not going to be accepted here in no, America. No, they're not. So now I'm However, willing to work for... However, if you get them in that field, yes. you know, as whether they're an apprentice or they're, you know, just get them in that environment, like so, get them a job at Surveyor Technics, for example. Okay, so now you've interviewed them and you know, and you've figured out what they're able to do. Right. What's That's next? Key. Then we populate a website yeah. and we have participating employers. Now, we vet these employers because they got to know we're going to have an Eng we're going to actually have a language rating as well. Some of them going to uh, speak more English than others. Some may speak no English, like your grandfather. Right. So employers need to be aware of what they're getting themselves into. But we want employers to understand that and have the capabilities of being able to introduce them into the workplace and, okay, and so support when is it, them. When when will we see some actual connecting of? Of the of these immigrants with jobs, the work permit. That's the key. They can't they can't work. However, we're not sitting on our hands yeah. waiting. We're going to get this program in place and then have them interviewed, have the resumes built, and have the website all good to go in anticipation and, and continue to put pressure on our congressional delegation to get this passed. I would I would challenge the city of Portland to say. Take a, take a stand, be bold, and, and let's pass some legislation. Like I said, marijuana was illegal federally. Yeah, but what can the city, city council do? was the first. What can they do about immigration status? They might be able to say to the feds, look, you, do, you, you want us to take care of them, pay for their housing. No, we're putting them to work. You don't like it, then give us the 20 or $30 million well, yeah, that they, we're paying but, to but take care of them. But it's up to the uh, elected politicians. It's up to Congress. Congress has to pass a law. True. And so that's the problem, and we're back to 
And another, Why don't we hold these politicians accountable? Here, you told us the entire main delegation is for this. That's great. But unfortunately, it takes a majority yeah. of the House and Senate. Four votes in the swing. And that's what people ought to be looking at. What are these? What, what are the majority going to do in the House and Senate to solve this problem? Now, before, you know, Harold, before I drove in here tonight, my wife Chrissy and I were watching the news, and Representative Pingree was on the news tonight, I think it was Channel 13, describing this bill that was being re. You know, so everything we're talking about. It's yeah. on the hot seat. And you don't have you to worry have, about them, they're for it. Right, right. You don't have to worry about some of these southern. True, that's true. You have to worry about them. You're right. It, it won't pass without support or in the Senate. So there's enough senators. But I don't think most people, and I think having you have me on this program, Harold, is another way to get that word out there. I think most people watching this are going, oh my God, this is so They'll simple and so you. straightforward. The people watching will what agree with you. What are they doing, you know? But the calculations going on by in the minds of conservatives in the Congress is different than what these people that are watching this think. I, so, I, don't, I don't disagree here. Different calculation. Here. You, you we'll know see. that world very but, well. But uh, look, why, why do we have enough uh, people skilled in various trades to supply the demand in Maine right now? Well, I think the, another initiative that you asked earlier there, what we've been working on, my wife Chrissy and I, and, and we've got a, a group of a very good Maine-based companies, we started it about 12 or 15 years ago. Our kids went to school and, and we'd go to the awards, you know, banquets, which is great, you know, and people get scholarships and, and all parents are proud, you know, when they're, when they're, um, when the you know, young adults do well uh, and their friends. But what we noticed was lacking was there was no recognition or celebration of anybody that was going into the trades. It was, it, it was you know, let's face it, Harold, 20 years ago, even 10 years, college or bust. If you're not going to college, you're not going to amount to anything. Yeah. You know, that, oh, yeah, you didn't get into college, well, yeah, good luck. So we recognize that and say, you know what, let's start, why don't we give scholarships for people just, young seniors or young adults just going into the trades? I'll never forget it. It moved me. I went down to Biddeford Ice Arena because we had opened up a new shop down Biddeford. It could be good for the community. Get down there, get some recognition. It's a $500 scholarship about 15 years ago. And I can remember standing up in front of that. It was a good turnout, probably 400 people there, parents, guidance counselors, teachers, and students. And I remember, you know, awarding that $500 scholarship to this young man, and it, the place just lit up. You know, his friends. Yeah. You know, it was probably like, you know, when I was in school, they probably think, geez, is Sean going to get a diploma? This guy, is he going to get a diploma? My God, he got a, he got a scholarship. You know, they were cheering, yeah. and it was awesome. So I came away from that. I said, like, man, we're going to do this. In, in all, all our communities that we serve, and that caught on, and the Risbera family, Risbera Construction, uh, Rocky and Billy, dad had passed, and, and they wanted to do something significant in his honor. So they contributed $75,000 uh, in addition to what Moody's was participating. That really what enabled us to go statewide. So that has grown from the Risbera contribution. Now, we're going to contribute over a hundred thousand dollars this upcoming uh, can't I want to say came this uh, graduation cycle the hundred thousand dollars is that to be used for tuition at community colleges it can be well we got new, we got free tuition right now which is wonderful uh, but oh, yeah, tools yeah. tool ships yeah you know to be a line alignment of a CMP or versant you got about to have about twenty five hundred dollars just worth of gear, you know, chaps and, and gloves yeah. and, and all the helmet, all the recommended gear. So, by getting businesses behind us, we're giving these scholarships across the whole state of Maine. In Memec, we're talking about Michael Bork and Tony Payne. Yeah, we took us a step further, Harold. You're gonna love this. So, I get thinking about this. I thought, you know, these influencing these students and supporting them and celebrating, changing that narrative at every high school and every CTE across this whole state. It's working. Governor Mills just recently gave $15 million to a CTE schools here in Maine. She gets the message. She knows yeah. that there's a deficit and she's contributing, stepping up. So we're making huge progress. So we came up with this concept. It's like, what if we gave instructors scholarships? What if we gave an instructor, an electrical instructor, a scholarship to work in an electrical company for a week? Because what happens, Harold, is someone's in the classroom, 
for 10 years. Yeah. Business, business is 10 it years ahead of... Change, yeah. Right. It, 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 they're disconnected from what was really needed in, it, in, in, the, in, the, uh, in the employment world. That's right, in the respective field. So now, with Memex financial support, we're able to offer and we've given instructor scholarships where these instructors go to best-in-class businesses to spend a whole week to learn about marketing, uh, manufacturing, best practices, um, what, where HR. are the shortages? Are there, are there shortages in auto repair? Are there shortages in plumbing? Are there shortages in electric? Across the board, Harold. Now think about this. Back when you and I were in school, they uh, had industrial arts uh, but, and home ec. I was in school long before you, but. But yeah, right, Harold. I mean, yeah. they did. They well, did away, with, they did away with that arts. twenty years ago, and I think in hindsight, it, it was probably short-sighted mm -hmm. because the skills that are that you need today to be successful, the technical skills, we call it skill bundling. When I was on the university system and the community college boards of trustees, we call it skill bundling. So it's not just critical thinking, strategic thinking, conflict resolution skills, but you also need how to physically work a keyboard, you know, or, mm -hmm. or figure out a program on a, on a device. Uh, and the technological skills that are, that are required by employers today are significant. So working with your hands is almost equally as important as working with your mind today to be successful. And these scholarships um, are changing the narrative ac across education. And you know we're very proud of our work. We, we want to celebrate the trades and elevate the trades because the, the funding, the upward mobility, you know, these jobs are paying 60, 80, you know, $100,000 a year. You go to school, you got $80,000 worth of debt. You're trying to find that job, you usually leave Maine, you know, because so, so, so there is a skill, there's a deficit of skilled workers then. Yes. Yes. And you, there's a, a tremendous investment. The Elfon Foundation invested uh, in the community college between, I think, state, federal, and the Alphon grant. They've got about 40. I think over forty million dollars to invest in workforce development because they know this is a crisis. I hear this term workforce development. It's a, everybody uses that term workforce development. What what is it? Are they training programs? Who where are the training programs? I keep th all I can think of. You'll have to help me and you help the audience too. When you say workforce development, I think okay, uh, community college training people in to be. Firefighters and electricians and plumbers and auto repair. Yep. Is that it? Tell me. That's that, that's because, their. That, you, it was got to be. Is that what we mean by well, workforce development? That's their core. That's what they do as a core, and they cover, you know, EMT, fire science. I mean, it, the amount of offerings they have at the community college system is extraordinary. It's it's amazing, but the workforce development dollars, which really is held head up by Dan Bellier for the community college system uh, and Dan's um, crew, that workforce development dollars is specific to industry. So in other words, Moody's, for example, applied for a grant, okay, to be spent to train our incumbent workforce. So we're taking employers with, you know, Bath Ironworks is, is a big participant, Chinbro. Uh, a lot of these main base companies take advantage of those training dollars through grants that we can invest in our coworkers to help them become more productive and, and raise their wages. Well, what if I've never worked in an auto repair <laughs> place and, uh, and uh, I didn't go to a technical high school where I learned how to fix cars? If I come to Moody's, I can't get a job, right? Because I'm untrained. No, we have our, actually have our own apprenticeship program. We call it Grow Our Own. So why so we'll would you hire me if I'm not totally unskilled? It's got a good attitude, okay. like you do, Harold. Yeah. You got see, you got a good attitude. You've got the right core. You're a good worker, Harold. If you're thinking of a career change, thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. So, so so okay. So you you hire people that don't have this training. You, right. It would be nice for you if a kid went to, uh, what's the technical high school? Yeah, Portland Arts and Portland Technology. Uh, yep. Yeah, Portland Arts and Technology. And they, do they, do they yes. learn how to do body work and they stuff? They do, they offer that program. They do? Yes. 
So you, there are kids coming out of there, not enough yes. probably. Not enough, but yes, there are. That know how to They've got put the a basics. new fender on a car. They've got the basics. Yeah. That's right. And I think it's, it's all your passion. You know, Harold, if you've got a, an individual, young adult, it's given that this is what we work at at the high school level, you know, through SOAR, excuse me, through Aspire, is getting individuals exposed to the trades at younger ages. By the time you're a junior or senior, you've, you've pretty much got a path, whether you're going to college or not. Yeah. Um, it's, it's difficult to, to do that later in life. You get it in the middle school or earlier. Yeah. Peak interest, you know, exposure. Get young people out there and try a few different things outside of the classroom, and we're having good results for that. So, all right. There's so, a lot going on in our educational system around what we're talking about tonight, because they recognize it at the state level that if we don't develop our workforce, then, you know, our overhead is going to outweigh our ability to earn. It's just like running your household. If your overhead is too high and you're not bringing in enough, more outgoing than ingoing, you're going. So part of the solution for to, to, to build up an adequate workforce is this uh, immigrant program Correct. that you're talking so, about. And so. part of it is our teenagers, making sure our teenagers have access in, to what they want to do and pursue and pathways that they want to take. And, and let's keep them in Maine. And the other cohort that we talked about is our, and, and we talked about this with Senator Collins, um, you know how they had the, um, it's called the, the Paycheck Protection Plan, right. the PPP program. I suggested that we call it the LPP, the Labor Participation Plan, so that we can take these cohorts, whether it's the teenagers, um, our immigrant population here in, in Maine, and seniors, you know, seniors that were basically forced out of the workforce because they can only earn a certain amount of money which makes no sense. Oh, you mean over 65, they want to collect Social Security. Right, exactly, you, Harold. You, you can't earn much. Yeah. Right. Well, yeah. But again, these, these were put in place to try to open up jobs for our younger people. There was a reason. You know, these laws were passed for a reason. And, and why they haven't gone in there and changed with the times is... I know the answer. You asked, you asked that rhetorical question, why they haven't gone in there and changed with the times, <laughs> because we have gridlock in Washington, and uh, all parties can do, what they do is obstruct. So, and I'm, and I'm going to say something now, now but, but I will tell you that I think one party is more focused on obstruction and the other party is more focused on legislating. But it's, it's nothing's getting done. I mean, you have a, you, you, you have a mindset of parties, and they're in the minority, saying our job is to make sure that nothing gets enacted in Congress, zero. That's got to change, and the only one way to change it, voters. Yep. The, right. The voters, they'll ultimately, they'll do what the voters allow them to do or want them to do. Ultimately, yeah. that's it. No, you're if right. If they you think know, the voters are we, for it, they'll be for it. You're right. We live in an environment where you know, and again, if you think about the population of political scientists in this country over the last couple of decades, how many people went to school for political science has gone up exponentially. So you sit around a table, come up with this political strategy on, you know, what are we going to say and how are we going to look good and be popular and say the right things. You're right, Harold. Maybe what we should do is, there's a law, right, against uh, what's it called, obstruction of justice. Maybe we should have a law that's obstruction of progress. <laughs> maybe, well, maybe that would maybe that would wake that, them up. That, that's the problem. It's the it's it's current American politics, and uh, the minority says our job is to make sure that this particular president doesn't get anything done. That we can then go and try to beat him in the next election by saying he hasn't accomplished anything, and we can. Make that happen. I so, think it's going to come full circle. I mean, I look at young people. You know, when you, when you talk about, um, you know, Bernie Sanders, right? Bernie Sanders had the mantra of the system's rigged. I, he's right. Their system is rigged. But what young people need to, to figure out is who rigged it, right? Bernie's been down there for 25 years so, or more. So I think young people, I really do, Harold, with the bottom of my heart, they're going to sort this out. And there's going to be a movement in the next 10 years that we've never seen before. And it'll be young people that do it. They'll finally start to figure out, connect these dots of who's telling the truth and who's looking out for their best interests and who isn't. 
I, I have complete faith. It's going to happen. I hope you're right. I think you may be right. It's usually young people that engineer change in society, and uh, because the rest of the people, they, they <laughs> don't want to upset the apple. Right? That's They're right. comfortable. Yeah. So uh, I think you may be right. But this program is, is uh, uh, that you created here is uh, very interesting. So do you work with, uh, uh, or have you met with the Immigration uh, Legal Assistance Program, ILAP? And we, we have so many people that are ready to participate that want to help. You know, yes. Beth Stickney is, you know, is yes. probably whom you're right. referring to. Beth is all about it. And we've kind of held off on getting more support and more help until we, you know, because we're more action-oriented, Harold. Once we get this administrator in place, once we start to build these resumes, once we get this thing moving, then that's when we'll seek those resources. Yeah. So, uh, and, we're, and we're talking within the next three to six months. This isn't going to be a long, drawn-out thing. Next yeah. three to six months. I, I, I hope this legislation gets passed, and I hope it gets oh, passed in yeah. a hurry. But it'd be something. Do you talk to Senator Collins about this yes. frequently? And yep. We, and again, we, we just talked recently, and she recognizes the, the things you said, but she emphasized that this she, is— She recognizes that this— She said this is a bipartisan—she she said, and she's right, and, and you, you alluded to it, Harold, it's, it's, they don't want to make it as simple as the work permit. They want to weave in all these other things. Which that's when you that's when people say, well, I can't go along with that. Yeah, yeah, I thought right. we were just going to talk about work permits. And that's the problem. So to your point, that's what she illustrated to me was we've got to try to find a way to keep this as simple as possible. If that's that's kind of an oxymoron in Washington D.C. Simple, but that's what she was really trying to impress upon me, the approach. But she's got a lot of let's face it, she's got a lot of tenure. She's got a lot of Democrat uh, colleagues that she's got some. Political capital with yeah, right that she's gone true. controversially gone different ways, and uh, I'd like to think that she sees the value because she she recognizes our participation rate here in Maine Herald has dropped into the mid 50s, which is about 10 percent less than New Hampshire, for example. It used to be in the mid 60s pre-pandemic. What, what do you mean participation rate? Uh, the number of people that are able to work that are actually working, it's in the mid. So it dropped about 10 points, and it hasn't recovered. And for the reasons that I how described. How do these people exist? I don't know how they go to the grocery store. That's it's a good question. I think, like I say, the 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 age, right? You are my yeah. generation. I've earned enough, so they don't have to work if they don't want to. Yeah. Um, and the teenagers can't work because of the labor laws, have so restrictive. They God, God forbid they get hurt. Yeah. I mean, look at. I love sports. Our kids all played sports. But look at the injuries that are related to sports broken and torn knees and this and that, right? It's all competition. Yeah. You went on the job site, my God, if you sprained your ankle, you'd be on the front page of the paper, right? These employers are running sweatshops. My God, these kids are getting hurt. Oh. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, you, you, you have obstacles, but the, but the program is good. You know, one of the things that uh, uh, the, the Department of Homeland uh, security has uh, has tried to lower the number of days it takes to get asylum status. Uh, the problem is that uh, they say they're overwhelmed, and right. they probably are. There are too many people seeking asylum. Uh, so when you apply for asylum, it could be three years. Before you get asylum status, meaning three years before you you get a work permit. We're losing. Once you get asylum status, then you apply. You get another, you know, eight months or right. ten, ten it's, months. It's terrible. It's unreal. Harold um, uh, Bruce uh, Bruce Ben is a good friend of mine, and this is kind of a, the backstory. I'd go into nap. I I love guys working on them. And I fix up old cars you, on the weekends. Wait a minute. You, you, do you know how to fix up cars? Well, I've got a little. Yeah. I'm, I'm good at fixing things, Harold. Very good <laughs> at fixing things. So I'd go to Napa on the weekend, and I met this young immigrant. His name was Bruce Benner. And he struck me as a really nice. We stayed in contact and touch. And Bruce is 
a really good friend and become a real good ally in this movement. And he, he told me that he has several friends in the immigrant population that are moving to Canada because they can work in Canada. So it's like, mm. and again, the thing that concerns me, as I said earlier, they all have cell phones, they all communicate, and if the word on the street back home is come to America, they'll take care of you. That is not what we want. We want that cell phone message to go, hey, we have opportunity, come up, I can get you a job, I'll get you started, and we can make a future here together. That's the people we want coming to America. I'm not convinced that that's the population, like you said earlier, Harold, because they're getting the word, oh, you get, what you get across the border, they gotta take care of you. That's, that's creating the problem, I think, personally. Well, we're travels, and I don't think we're sending the right message on, on what America's all about. Well, it's not so nice when they get here under these circumstances, okay? They can't work. They, you know, yes, they get help from the Human Services Department, but you can't go on forever. You can't. No, First of all, they know. get that help in their own countries, you know? Yeah, and then they, they start can, working under the table or, you yeah, know, it, they, nefarious they things. They can do that. I don't think, it, it's tough, I don't know. think that anybody will, uh, will travel through jungles, through pay, pay people to right. take them across, That's right, nearly know. drown, carrying babies. Uh, I don't think anybody will risk their life uh, just to get a welfare check. Well, okay. I, I, I don't, think, I don't so. think that that's that they put those dots together. But I think someone's soliciting them. Say, hey, we got it pretty good. Come maybe, up here. Maybe you know. But but they, uh, uh, maybe you know when my grandfather's came in the village streets, they said, just and the, uh, the village streets in. Southern Greece, they say, go to America, where the streets are lined with gold. Well, you know? that, that, but there's an old saying, if you can. The word gets back quickly. It's not lined with gold, gold. <laughs> okay? And because these people, when they right. get here, they're communicating with their oh, family tough. back home, and they're telling them, here's what I went through. Yep. I, t I, to right, I told this story once before on this show, and I love the story. About your grandfather? No, about my grandfather, but also about a movie called America, America, which is uh, 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 produced and directed by Elia Kazan, who's a famous producer. It's about immigration. I, I love the movie. Anybody who's interested, just go online and figure out how you can watch through streaming or otherwise, America, America. And it's about Kazan's uncle, and he was a Greek, from Asia Minor, and his uncle was the first in his family to get to this country, and he went through hell to get here. Hell. Literally. And he, Kazam was asked by some reporter after the movie came out, did you ever talk to your uncle about what he went through and why he was willing to go through, he went through, to get to America? And he said, yes, I did. Wow. And he had three words in answer. He was saving himself. Wow. He saved himself. And for many of these immigrants mm. that go through jungles on leaky boats or wherever, I'm not saying we right. need order. We need a system right. to bring order out of chaos. We have chaos now. That's up to Congress. Hold them accountable for the chaos. Hold them accountable because they won't vote on a comprehensive immigration reform bill. They won't vote on it. It's, it's, it's criminal what's going on. But I agree with you. These people, they're saving themselves. They're risking their lives to save themselves. This is the greatest country oh. that has ever yeah. existed on this planet yeah. by far, and they know it, and they want it. How can you fault somebody for wanting to better their lives and f somehow get to the greatest country that ever existed on this planet? Criticize them for that? We're all no. immigrants, right, when you yeah. really think about it. And it's gone through phases, right, Harold, that you yeah. described. Yeah. Ellis Island, you know, we've gone through phases. And you're right, the, 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 the functionality 
around immigration and immigrants is so, is so bad that they don't even know it. it it's like paralysis through analysis. They, they want to try to fix the whole thing, and yeah. you've got to do it one bite at a Take this, right. and let's implement this. Like the Susan and let's Collins get this working, bill, yeah. you know? And let's ease some of that social tension that we have right now. Yeah. Get these people out there so they can start earning a living and, and building a reputation for themselves and the community. Look how well respected the Greeks are today in this country. That all happened because the back-breaking work the village boys that came. was established. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. The Pacers boys came. <laughs> the village boys. But yeah. And no. Italians, for that matter. Oh, the French. No, all of them, even huh? the Asians. Well, the Asians especially. They're proud, they're proud people, and they've worked they, hard. They, they are hard And they have a heritage. People. Yeah. But remember, in the 1920s, before that, actually, Chinese Exclusion Act, the Congress passed yeah. an act saying no, no Asians, more. no Chinese, none. Yeah. So what's this about human nature? Human beings, since they were in caves, are suspicious of and afraid of strangers, people different <laughs> than them. They are. We, all of us, we're human beings. We all have those instincts. And that's what happens to immigrants. You know, they're different. And we have, we're no different in this country than other human beings. We're I, I, I'd afraid like to think of that we're strangers. I feel like to think that we've gone beyond the, the, the human nature. I'm not saying that that, you know, wasn't the case and hasn't been. But I think now, I honestly think with all um, the awareness today. I hope you're it's right. It's different. It is. It's different. I you hope look you're at right. individuals walking down the street or, or you interact I, with. It's much different. I hope human beings are better than they were a thousand years no ago. Question. You think of all the human beings, all true. the wars, the slaughters. Read, read world history. Slaughters constantly. Every, every, every yeah. hundred years, wars that kill massive stuff. Look what's happened in Russia. Right. That's right. human. Those are human beings that attacked Ukraine. Right. Human beings. Why? Harold, I, one thing helped me with this. We're getting off our we have topic, to, but that's getting, all right. We got to end it a you, minute. You got you got the mind for this stuff, but that military you know buildup took you place over there. Well, now we, wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute. I got to tell you, we have to end this right now. <laughs> okay. We can talk about the Ukraine afterwards. I started this. I want to thank you for coming. Thank you, Harold. Thank you. My pleasure.